Do you trust your parents? <laughs> when we're little, we really have no choice but to trust our parents. Uh, they keep us safe, not just physically, but from the unknown. They're kind of like our vessels for knowledge of the universe. They're kind of like our, our uh, science superheroes. But at some point, probably kind of like these fine people, you might have realized your parents were flawed, maybe just a little bit even. So I'd like you to think about for a second when that might have happened. I'll give you some options. Maybe you were just a baby, <laughs> maybe a little older, kid, teenager, even a little later, or maybe you still think they're perfect and you're deluding yourself. <laughs> uh, when I first started writing this, it was supposed to be about a class that I teach in pseudoscience and skepticism. But as I wrote, I kind of realized how much my own history is steeped in the relationship of science and trust. My history with my family, my history with my parents, especially my father. So that's where we're going to start, and that's where this is going to go, whether you like it or not. Uh, here's my parents. They were both uh, teachers in New York City for over 40 years. My mom in elementary school, teacher, my dad with the sweet porn stash. Uh, <laughs> he was a high school science teacher, just like myself. Uh, but he actually didn't want to be a teacher at first. He was a little bit of a hippie. Uh, he was not a big fan of the war in Vietnam, but he was more of like a pseudo-hippie in that he liked the idea of drugs without ever actually doing any. <laughs> um, he then got his draft card in the mail, though, even though he didn't want to be a teacher, and his mom freaked the hell out and got him an emergency teacher's license. I'd never heard of such a thing, <laughs> but he told me that was the case, so I trust him. Um, here he is again. Uh, he started his career as a middle school, all, uh, middle school teacher in an all-girls middle school, where he infamously, for a frog dissection experiment, couldn't bring himself to <laughs> execute the 28 frogs in the traditional manner of breaking their spines. So instead, he dipped them in formaldehyde, <laughs> thinking that would do the trick. And when the girls started, you know, opening up the frogs, sort of in the middle, the frogs woke up. <laughs> I taught middle school for a couple of years. I can't even imagine that kind of chaos. <laughs> <sighs> he uh, is kind of my hero. He's like my science superhero. I, he, in many ways, he's a better man than I. And he taught me for my entire childhood to trust in the processes of science, to be curious, and overarching the whole thing is to question, to question everything. He said that over and over and over, and so that, of course, includes questioning him, because I really honestly try to. So that brings me to my childhood. Uh, when I was a kid and my friends came over looking for snacks, I don't know if you're familiar with Hydrox, they're like the sort of Oreos. Um, <laughs> They were always in this combination of hilarity and shock when they opened the cabinet and found an arsenal of vitamins. <laughs> uh, I don't really know, thinking back years later, I'm not really sure why I was laughing, probably because they were. But I think they have been laughing, maybe deep down, they knew that this old man was being preyed upon by industries because of his cognitive biases. And it turns out my science superhero might have been a little bit flawed. It turns out he's been to alternative medicine my entire life. Uh, it started on the vitamin train when I was really young. I went to everything you can imagine, essential oils, CoQ10, omega-3s, and of course he is now gluten-free. <laughs> And we argued fervently about these things for at least the past maybe decade, uh, at least since I was a science teacher. And he would throw at me magazine articles, maybe sketchy websites that were selling the products they were touting. He would say, like, oh, probiotics are really important for your gut bacteria. And I would throw at him peer-reviewed journal articles 
that say, were ambiguous at best. The scientists who study gut bacteria don't even take probiotics. There's 10,000 different bacteria interacting in millions of different ways. If one company tells you that this is exactly what you need at exactly that time, it's just... <sighs> but that was all kind of innocuous fighting. It was just, you know, son, father bickering. That's really, that's really all it was. But then, <clears throat> sorry. But then my mom got sick. Whew. Whew, sorry. Abdominal cancers are arguably the worst. She got a pain in her side, and she was gone a few months later. In the intervening months, she got the usual treatments, surgery, chemo. My dad, of course, wanted the more natural ways. <sighs> I'm sorry. And my sister and I, we fought him on those things. And he rarely won, but in retrospect, it hurt. It hurt that not only did we have to fight, but we fought about something that I thought we'd be simpatico on for life. And my mom fought him on it too, but sometimes she was too weak to fight, and sometimes she actually agreed with him. She was a very intelligent person. She has the master's degrees to back it up, but she had very little scientific training. And this is where I think it goes well beyond my family, as most of you know, into the wider world. Uh, this is something we deal with in our classrooms. And this brings me sort of to the classroom where I like to talk about truth, this whole thing about truthiness and, um, you know, fake news and all the stuff we've talked about before, or at least most of you have heard about before. And so what I do with my students when it comes to truth uh, is this article, The Relativity of Wrong. Um, I highly recommend it. Uh, he'll, he'll, he would, of course, say it a lot more eloquently than me, but here's the basic argument. You can say that the Earth is flat, and that would be wrong. You could say the Earth is a sphere. That would also be wrong, but one is more wrong than the other. Not all wrongs are equivalent. Not all truths are equivalent. And when it comes to science and the facts and theories of science, truth, as a lot of you know already, is not, it doesn't have a definitive definition. It's more like an ever-decreasing gap in our knowledge. Uh, for example, uh, especially if you're physics teachers out there, but if you're not, you might know that Newton's laws, great, love those Newton's laws, they can get us to the moon, to Pluto, and beyond, but we need Einstein's relativistic corrections to program our GPS. So uh, this brings me to my class. Uh, I'm pretty lucky in that I teach this elective. It's called Modern Physics, uh, mostly uh, relativity and quantum field theory. And I'm really lucky in that there's no standardized exam. I really like these memes. I don't know if you noticed. <laughs> so I get to... <laughs> <laughs> Some of you get it. Um, <laughs> so I get to kind of do what I want, at least the first couple of weeks. I decided to do it on skeptici uh, skepticism, pseudoscience. And so we talk about things like climate change denial, intelligent design, astrology, ghost hunting, Sasquatch locating. <laughs> and I think I do this at least partly because I don't want my students to be duped the way my father was. Uh, and speaking of being duped, I think it's also important to realize, at least for me, I don't know who's thought about this before, for me, and I try to say to my students, that not being duped isn't that easy for, I think, anybody. And I think one way to talk about that is this. Everybody's got one of these? Maybe, or maybe some losers of androids or something? <laughs> um, <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. So uh, how many, I don't have my pocket, how many people here really in detail know how it works? Yeah, okay. So, maybe one of, if you have a couple PhDs, maybe. You know, it sends like this light beam out to space and back, and it has all of human history on it. It's, it's a magic box. <laughs> so, if, you, if we're okay, most of society's okay with this kind of magic box, why not be okay with some other magic box? You know, crystals will heal you, or uh, you can talk to your dead relatives, or whatever it happens to be. So, I, try to, I really try to be empathetic for the dupies, which are sometimes myself, and I try to talk to my students about that too. 
Um, and to really get that across, uh, what I have them do is, well, if you noticed, the Sasquatch loca location algorithm, that's not real, not yet. Uh, for the end of the pseudoscience unit, we do, uh, they, the final project is for them to create their own pseudoscience product. And the rubric is basically sell it. You gotta sell it, try to work on our cognitive biases to sell it. And so this Sasquatch location algorithm was one they made. I personally think it would really sell. The research I've done, it was that's some tough research. But to figure out like, who actually would buy these things, it seems like it would really sell, even at $20 a pop. Um, some of their, this is some of their slides. You got uh, made up science, graphs, doctored pictures, pointless maps. It's really, <laughs> it's perfect. It's absolutely, I think it's really perfect. Uh, another one of their slides has these goals and rewards. <laughs> it's pretty great. <laughs> it really works. <laughs> Still reading? <laughs> Um, so, uh, to conclude, if you really like any of these ideas, anything I said, please meet me after the talk and uh, bring your checkbook. Do people still have checkbooks? <laughs> whatever you have, Venmo, whatever. Um, and you can buy my own personal, differentiated, future-proofed, college and career-ready, cognitive bias detecting incense. <laughs> please do that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.